me no hard questions though. Okay. Uh, good evening, um, sports fans. <laughs> Actually, no sports. <laughs> this is uh, Alan Bergano uh, with the Filipino American Has National Historical Society Hampton Roads chapter. And I'm doing a video here with my good friend, John Ragutis of the Seattle chapter in trying to, to uh, make video uh, comments on the informational packet that, uh, that uh, I've sent to you. Usually in our Fonz Now Zoom events, uh, all people will have these informational packets. And in the beginning of our programs, uh, we would kind of sift through what's in it and then start the program. But because of the uh, number of speakers that we will be having on each day, I thought it would be, it'd be nice that we did this uh, informational packet description prior to the actual session so that will also save time. And uh, John, uh, luckily he agreed to this because he'd always uh, wanted to be um, part of something that nobody's ever done. And this definitely nobody's ever done as far as sending a preliminary instruction sheet, but uh, hopefully you enjoy it. And uh, I'm just glad John is with us today. And uh, you wanna say something, John, before we start? Yeah, hey, how's it going, Doc? That's good, man. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm, I'm a little key, you know, I'm, I was working the background. Yeah, well, in case you didn't know, John, John is a, is a Vietnam vet. Uh, he was also uh, one of the uh, 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 organizers in organizing the Filipino American Vietnam veterans to start sharing their expertise and stories, you know, to to to, to the public because those stories have been remained silent. And if it wasn't for John, uh, he's bringing these voices up. So uh, he's uh, served our country. He served our community because he was the executive director of the Filipino Youth Activities for how many years, John? What, 20, 30? About years? 30 years. About yeah. 30 years. And that was the primary organization for us youth um, to help us navigate our brown skin and flat noses in America. Ain't that right, John? Yeah. Except for I had no flat nose because I'm a so, you know, <laughs> I took my mom's nose, man. Okay. My so, dad did. Okay. Okay. So uh, just bear with us. Uh, this is low key, but at least uh, we're here for you to help you prepare for one of the most uh, iconic uh, presentations anybody will ever see. Yeah. And so we're very excited about this. And I would like to thank you for taking the time out to watch the show. And hopefully you would get something out of this as much as uh, the time and effort that everybody has put into this and also the time and effort that everybody has put in over the past 50 years. Because a lot of the people that you will see in the next two days, they were at the conference and they've never left the community and they're still working in the community. Right, right, they all so, are. Uh, with that said, uh, let's uh, give it a shot, John. Yeah. Okay. So this is what you will be receiving in the informational packet. Uh, the first ones is we'll show we'll have the Zoom links. Uh, this is for October second, and for a lot of you uh, new timers that have never been on Zoom, this is what you would click. This uh, this thing right here. This is called a hyperlink, and if you click that, you'll get into the Zoom session. So that's October second. This is October third. Scroll down. This is what we we request to, for the session. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody make sure you are muted uh, so that we don't hear any un, unwanted sounds. And also do not show a blank screen, show something, because if you're going to, um, you know, show something black on blank, it's just going to be very, very distracting to not only the speakers, but also to the people in the audience. And uh, I'll warn you right now, if you do not comply to any of this will result in John, is that what would that result in if you don't comply, John? Uh, them blankety blank words that you <laughs> didn't put on the screen. Okay, good. So make sure you're muted and don't show a blank screen. We would really appreciate that. Uh, the next thing is uh, we did a little dry run session on Saturday. 
and it was uh, pretty good. So you'll, it'll be a taste as far as what you're gonna witness you know, over the next two days. So, uh, so I just put that in there just to give you a kind of a warm up preview as to you know, what to expect. Now, um, here's the background. Uh, we tried to uh, put together some things that would describe what it was like in 1971 in America. Uh, first thing would be the, me the means of communication. The only thing we had back then was a phone and there was a li landline and snail mail. Now, for those that don't know what snail mail is, uh, can you describe that, John, what a snail mail is? Snail mail is just your regular mail, you know. Used to be able to get it in a day or two if it's in city, but now I could see mail taking four or five days and maybe five to seven days to get cross country. Before it never took that long. But it's how still much, snail mail because you, you had to wait a while before you knew knew what was going on. Do you remember how much a, a, a stamp cost back in them days? I think it was about seven or eight cents yep. uh, for first and class. Then, and then if you went air mail, it was like 10 or 15 cents. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? But yeah. the thing was is that it was very, very limited. Like uh, we didn't have no internet. There was no smartphone. No cable TV and color TV was just being introduced. And that's if you had a TV. Ain't that right, yeah, John? That's right. A lot of us had black and white TVs with, with them rabbit ears, uh, either on the you know, antenna on the roof or in the house. And you had to play with them a lot in order to get good reception. That's right. Um, and then we had these uh, political assassinations, which really impacted a lot of us. Uh, President John F. Kennedy. Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., and also Robert Kennedy. And these assassinations were just shocking to us. It's like, why would they do that? But that's what happened and it really affected a lot of us as far as uh, people of color and uh, <clears throat> just profound you know, assassinations. Uh, personality, uh, many, this is where there was this young fighter out of Louisville, Kentucky, and he was named Cassius Clay, and he changed his name. He goes, I don't want my slave name. My name now is Muhammad Ali. And this was an iconic role model for a lot of us that were young and male and saying, wow, this guy's talking much smack, but he's backing it up. Uh, John, did you want to say any comment there about Muhammad Ali? Muhammad Ali was, was, was someone that we all could look up to. He took on the US, he took on the army, uh, because he didn't want to fight in the war. And I could understand that uh, uh, when, he was, when he was here, because it happened after I was in the service. When I went in the service and I was there in Vietnam fighting the war, and I, I thought it was, you know, for communists, take out communism, so none of them people wouldn't be coming up here in the United States. Well, as we found out later, as I left and as I got here, that wasn't the truth. They lied to us. But what we had was fighting for each other and keeping us alive and trying to make sure that we all made it back from a war that nobody wanted. Yeah. And that's yeah. what Cassius Clay did. Or and, excuse me. And, and he, went, uh, he went against the trend. Like uh, yeah. nobody would say anything like that. Or, you know, and so to, to and that's why I put, it was a time of change, transformation to becoming uh, for a lot of us to become more outspoken and principled when it becomes a norm for people of color. That was our hero. Uh, now you have these little articles that, that I, I, I picked out. Again, uh, these are hyperlinks. You just click on that and it'll take you to the article for you to study and some of the terms that you may not be uh, you know uh, heard of. But uh, back then you had racism, discrimination, segregation and this phenomenon called redlining. So I put an article that on there, uh, school busing to help uh, desegregate the neighborhoods. Uh, they bust out uh, people in the um, uh, black neighborhoods up to the white schools. Then you have this thing called affirmative action and also the educational opportunity program at the University of Washington. Also, there was a lot of anti-Vietnam war protests. Kent State was pretty shocking. Uh, where four students, you know, got shot for just to protest the war. Uh, Native Americans, they had this phenomenon called wounded knee. You could look that up. For Blacks, uh, Black is beautiful. You had the Black Panthers. 
the Mexican Americans, they had the, the Chicanos and the Asian Americans uh, were towards the end and uh, they had the Asian American movement. So these are some of the factors that were going on in 1970 is a lot, a lot of changes, a lot, a lot of change in uh, thought, ideology, clothes, hair, style. It was just uh, <laughs> a very diverse time for everybody. You want to say anything about that, John? No, I mean, it was something that had to happen, something that made us aware that we needed to continue the struggle and work on the, with the struggle because uh, we just weren't getting what we deserved. None of us, none of the minorities did. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. And so um, here's a little uh, uh, notes there on uh, Filipino America between 1920 and 1970. Um, there were uh, men, pre predominantly men, they were called Pinoys or Manongs. They immigrated to the mainland in the United States in the 1920s and 30s. There are approximately 45,000 that came to the mainland United States. They were the only Philippine immigrant group that were classified as US nationals when they left the Philippines. Then in 1934, they were called aliens. And then because of World War II, they became American citizens. And those were the monos. Um, that was uh, my father and also John's father is in that group. Uh, during World War II, a, a significant majority fought in the US military services, the Army and Navy. <clears throat> and others, though, continued to work in the agricultural fields and the Alaska salmon canneries because the army had to had to be fed. Somebody had to go, you know, pick the crops and you know can the salmon so that you know our soldiers would not uh, you know go hungry. So somebody had to do it. And so there are other the Pinoys also did that. There were also Pinoys in the 1920s and 30s, although the ratio was uh, about 14 men to one woman, and some places was even higher than that. But there were women. Then after World War II, we had this other next population that started to come in were, uh, were brides of the, of the monos that fought in World War II when they went to uh, the Philippines. There was a lot of uh, uh, the first island that, 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 that they, that they uh, came into the Philippines was Leyte. And so you had a lot of uh, Ilocano men and Visayan women uh, you know, hooked up. And so that was... Uh, the war brides, um, that was a pretty significant population there in Seattle. Um, then you had this late families uh, syndrome uh, because there was this huge age discrepancy between the husband and wife, approximately 10 to 15 years and John, probably even more. Yeah. What do you a think? A lot of them were like, the, like a lot of them that I knew were like them were 20 years older than the women. Yeah, yeah. Um, in Seattle, uh, we lived in segregated communities, and it's usually pre among the pre uh, pre predominantly Black neighborhoods. Uh, we could not live in certain parts of the city, so it's very, very segregated. And this is an important factor for everybody to understand that because of the limited financial <laughs> resources, because a lot of the moms back then, they didn't go out and get jobs. They were full-time moms. They would stay home. And it became a major decision for high school graduates to even go to college. Um, and so you had educational institutions like the like EOP at the University of Washington, and their job was to recruit and retain disadvantaged minority students and provide economic and academic resources to ensure college graduation. Was that about right, John, when you graduated from high school? Like, uh, you didn't think you were going to go to college or, you know, go ahead and just fill us well, in I didn't on think, that. I didn't think I was going to go, but, but the other problem was that counselors weren't pushing us to go to four-year college. They weren't pushing us to go to college at all. Uh, if you were lucky, they talked about community college. At least that's what they did with me. So um, that's what I did. Went to the community college and in there, um, while I was taking a full time, which was 12 hours, Unbeknownst to me, they switched it to 15 hours. Therefore, since full time was 15 hours and I was taking 12, I got drafted. <laughs> That's how I, I ended up in Vietnam. And there was a significant amount of uh, of, of your contemporaries that yes, very, very in much. Vietnam. Yeah. 
And so, uh, yeah, that's uh, that was kind of, you know, what it was like. 1965 was a tremendous change in the community. Yeah, the, uh, the, there was a change in immigration law. Essentially, the Filipino immigrant population just boomed. And because of the uh, huge influx of the uh, immigrant Filipinos, you had these new problems, like uh, underemployment was one, uh, which is actually what happens is like if you were a doctor in uh, the Philippines and when you came to the United States, you could not become a doctor. Uh, you had you were regulated down to like an orderly or you know something much lower. Uh, not only uh, doctors, but also like if you're an engineer or even an accountant, you became just a bookkeeper or you know a draftsman. And, and so there was this thing called underemployment. Uh, accent discrimination was very, became very very prevalent. But the biggest thing was a huge tension between Philippine born and American born. Uh, AM and PM. And uh, FYA was very, very, very instrumental in help uh, uh, negotiate that divide. Did you want to say something about that, John, the, uh, the well, immigrant problem? I think that's what helped me understand and, and know that I was Filipino and to be proud of it was the FYA, because those who be, were, came and joined the programs within the FYA we considered all of them Filipino. Whether you had one drop of blood or no drop of blood, you were still Filipino. Um, I think that the other thing is American born versus Philippine born. See, I was born and I was raised in the central area. So I, um, uh, there was a lot of Filipinos there, Philippine born, American born. And we all, we all got along because we, we went to school there with, with the, with each other, and we got to know each other. I think the problem you have, the problem, you need to um, The problem is that um, when you don't have that many there, when you don't have that many there, um, and you can't get along with, you can't, I'll try you can't, uh, <laughs> acculturate with each other. Uh, so that made things hard when they weren't w with each other and together. I think the other thing is because most of us were lived in, in the central area. Now the central area, although it was predominantly black, there was a lot of um, Japanese, Chinese, uh, Native Americans, and Filipinos. And we all got along. I mean, we all got to know each other, went to school with each other. I think that was that was a big difference uh, between where we were, uh, where we were brought up, uh, which is the same thing with the FYA, because they the FYA made sure Philippine youth activity made sure that you knew you were Filipino and to be very very proud of it. Yes, yes, yes. And so in 1970, I would say about maybe 75 percent of our community of the population were derived from the Monong generation. Yeah. Uh, Identity crisis was very, very prevalent among a lot of us second generation, born and raised here in, in America. Uh, essentially, like John said, we were born brown, raised in black neighborhoods, but we live in white society, society. And Uncle Fred coined the phrase, a minority within a minority within a minority. So questions of who am I, what am I, where do I fit in was very, very, very common. And uh, you know what were we? Filipino, Filipino, Filipino American, so forth and so on, and also the mestizo. And so, with all this identity crisis thing going on, um, FYA under the leadership of uh, Auntie Dorothy, Uncle Fred said, "You know, we could let's put something together to help us uh, uh, find out exactly what our role is and who we are." So we came up with the uh, 1971 Young Filipino. People's Far West Convention. Here's the program. Everybody's wondering, does anybody have a program? So here's the program. Let me just fix this a little bit so I can see. Okay. This is thank you, Mel Lagasca, for donating the program because uh, it was very, very hard to, to get, but we found one. Um, Quest for emergence, that's, that was a theme. 
Uh, this is the. Uh... Can you see that, John? Or am I messing up? <laughs> no, I can see it. Okay. Uh, this is the logo. A quest for emergence. Young Filipino People's Far West Convention. Seattle University. Uh, and then if you turn your head, this is, these are the major uh, uh, sponsors and what you would expect. And when I read this purpose, I said, my goodness, you know, that was pretty harsh as far as what's the purpose, but uh, it's so harsh, I'd like to read some of this. Uh, it is obvious that we Filipino Americans have not really made it in the society. Nowhere at decision-making levels or in economically or politically influential positions is the Filipino found. Nowhere is he known for his achievement. He is hidden in the back room of restaurants washing dishes. He is hidden in the service rooms of most buildings to do the janitorializing after everyone has left. He is hidden among those who have poor grades in school and have dropped out of the competitive mainstream. Conditioned by almost 400 years of colonial prostration forced on us by the Spanish and Americans, we have been sterilized of the motivation to achieve and better ourselves. Obviously, we have learned our role well, as those who have imposed this mind trap on us. This must be changed. We must emerge from this repressed state. This convention is a step in our quest of emergence. Wow. What do you think, John, when you, when you read that? Is that pretty accurate? That's accurate. I think it's accurate all to now. Uh, today, for what we what we want to do, for what we're trying to achieve. <clears throat> yeah, you're right. You're right. And that was written 50 years ago. That, yeah, you're right. Exactly. And here's the need uh, to focus on our lack of motivation and attempt to understand the situation as it is and confront it. Thus, the forums and workshops will revolve around the specific problems, militating against the motivation to emerge from our Filipino youth. So in other words, it was, they had foresight that if things were going to change, the youth are going to have to get involved because right. we need their energy. What do you think, John? Uh, that's very true. There are, we're our leaders of tomorrow. And, and you can see from some of the people that will be speaking and on these panels, uh, they were youth at the time. It's kind of hard to believe, huh? but yeah, we were yeah. youth. <laughs> That's right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay. We were young back then. <laughs> and, and so this is like the schedule of the program was in Seattle Youth. <laughs> uh, Wednesday, uh, you have this keynote thing and stuff like that. But the interesting that I was looking at is they list no names as far as who in the hell were the speakers. Why do you think that was, John? Uh, well, they I'm, I'm guessing they probably weren't sure or they didn't get confirmation on uh, who was going to speak on it or they had a, a few people because this was put together and, you know, we had to run with it, get the program done. So rather than list names and not be sure, they probably just left them off. Well, I, I have a, I, I kind of have an idea, but this is not, you know, true, but this is just my opinion. Uh, again, there was this thing called McCarthyism that plagued in the 50s. And what it was is that if you were paid a communist or, or if you were a subversive group against America, the FBI was on your butt and yeah. like, you know, mess up your credit. Uh, you can't get employment, so forth and so on. And so some of the stuff, these speakers were so-called, uh, you know, they just didn't like how America was and they wanted to make changes, but then they didn't want to put their names down because that would imply that a lot of the attendees would be also future subversive people. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's why no names were mentioned. And uh, that's what it was like during that time, too. If you said anything bad about America, you better watch out. The big man, you might be assassinated <laughs> or you'd be put on this blacklist where you can't get employment. It was kind of that atmosphere back then for people of color. And uh, 
what do you say? What do you say, John? Isn't that true? Yeah, that's, that's possibly true because we had a lot of uh, people that that were fighting the system, uh, and they were there to let us know what they had to go through and what it entailed, and, and it wasn't no easy easy thing putting it together. So you know, a lot of times we had to worry about uh, the establishment and what they might do. True. True. Uh, and then here are the, now here are the goals. And uh, uh, you can see the tone of whoever wrote this. It's totally different than, than, the, uh, than, than in the very beginning, but uh, I won't read it, but this is well, well while you're reading. Uh, sponsoring organization again was the FYA. Uh, and then here's your registration form, 25 bucks back then, which was a lot. You know to attend so very very interesting uh and then here are the oops why did i do that dang hold on hold on people <laughs> you're, you're gonna get this anyway but here are some of the topics watch this thing mess up okay here we go there you go there's the four Forum and workshop topics. There's a whole list of stuff here. Uh, this is this is probably my uh, my <laughs> like this one's crazy. Filipino youth and the education problem. Wow, <laughs> that was it back then. Uh, and various shades of brown, American Filipino, blah blah blah. So you guys could see that transportation and lodging. Wow, you know it's like. Uh, Transportation to and from Seattle must be burdened by the delegates themselves. Well, <laughs> yeah, they had to put it down. But, but the FYA will provide in-city transportation needs and lodging for delegates who are under 19 and who are attending college while in Seattle for the convention. That must have been a nightmare for you, John, trying to you know organize <laughs> that. Can you put a little bit of... Well, I, we kind of got some vans uh, uh, given to us so we could use to transport the kids. I believe we got a bus. Um, we got sleeping bags. Uh, uh, Larry was able to get uh, the counselor for the FYA, Larry Flores. Uh, he's on one of the panels here. Uh, in case we, the, we didn't, there weren't enough beds for people to sleep uh, over there. Uh, Seattle U was, uh, we had, were able to have them lodged in, in one place, uh, the kids. So it made it a lot easier for them so they could communicate with each other. So, you know, it, 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 we did a lot of work trying to get things to help out. And some uh, of the um, nonprofit agencies, uh, Ski Up Model Cities, uh, Youth Division donated stuff to help us put this on. Okay. Um the uh well you guys can all read this stuff here let me go down to here so that's that's it that was it yeah <laughs> okay uh and we has a has yeah, a I've question a question meeting with uh suzanne our consultant she said she, she's available again uh, are we are you available next wednesday that's fine <laughs> okay uh all right so that was a sense of how significant for us 50 years ago, uh, what, that, what that conference meant to us. Uh, thank you, Mel and John, for those comments. You know, a lot of this is, is, is we need now. I mean, we haven't really began to, to bust the bubble and actually enjoy um, uh, what we deserve and what we, sh we should have coming to us. Yeah, so, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. Especially with the resources that we have today, because I'm like, yeah. God, back then it was only snail mail and a telephone. <laughs> but I think uh, we will have uh, another uh, follow-up on this 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 weekend and um, try to get the youth involved. And uh, because that's what's going to, that's, that's what it's going to have to take. Us old people, you know, we don't want to take the, uh, the reins anymore. We need to just mentor and, and instill confidence in our in our next generation to say, hey man, you're you're it's your turn. You're up. 
And the name of the conference is, is, as you can see right there, Young People's Far West Convention. And it's the young people that need to get these, these things done. Uh, we, we can't do it all. I mean, we're all getting old now. I'll admit to it, but you know, what can I say? Hey, you know, but then we'll do the best we can. We will give oh, yeah. If anything, we'll, we'll work with you, we'll help you, you know, but it's, 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 it's you that's going to make this work. Yeah. And I'll tell you, you know, tell you the truth. If we could do it, <laughs> I know do it. you all could do yeah. it. That's right. <laughs> And in the end here, uh, we have our bios. Um, you'll have like day one, October 2nd, here's your list of speakers. And look at, there's a lot of speakers here. And uh, the session's only uh, 90 minutes long. And so we're trying to cut down on a lot of this time by providing you the, the uh, bio so that we, each one doesn't have to introduce themselves. And if you did that like three minutes each and that's freaking a half an hour. It's like, whoa. <laughs> so we try to cut that down. We're gonna cut down on the, the informational packet uh, tour and hopefully um, uh, this will be all blue by the time the conference, you know, uh, the session starts on October 2nd. Now, some of, some of them don't wanna put their bios and I'll respect that, we'll respect that because, you know, they, they, they don't wanna brag but that's okay. Just know that uh, um, uh, uh, you know we give them the opportunity to put it down if they don't if they choose to. Cool. If not, that's cool too. Because bottom line, they were there. They made a contribution. They made Auntie Dorothy's list to show up or be put down on the program. So uh, thank you, panelists, for taking the time out. And uh, it's, it's going to be exciting uh, two days. Uh, let me put stop share. Uh, stop share. Okay, so that's the informational packet uh, description. I'm glad that we did it, John, because uh, you were also very, very instrumental in the uh, success of that program. And unfortunately, you weren't included as one of the panelists, but that's okay, because we got you on screen today. <laughs> so I thank you there. Did you want to have any parting words <laughs> before I sign off? And people could say, well, I like to say thank you, John, because yeah, you've been my know. mentor since day when I first met you. Because I, I, John came from the war. I mean, you could tell who the Vietnam War vets were, because he never took off his army pants. No, I didn't. I, I wore it when I got back. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's it, it's there for our young people, uh, the, the students, the kids, uh, to move even further, to make it uh, <clears throat> make it a country in which we all can get together and we all can have part of what's going on, not just be in the background. Right on, right on. Okay. So well, again, thank you, John. Thank you, uh, fellow registrants. Thank you, Auntie Dorothy. Thank you, panelists. And uh, we'll see you October 2nd and 3rd. Enjoy the rest of your day and just understand the meaning behind TGIF. Oh no, before I said, this is the beginning of Filipino American history, right, John? Right, right. And. Uh, I have to say that a lot of people don't understand why October is chosen as Filipino American History Month. So if you well, good. tell you them know, how it works, you know, yeah, tell them how it works, man. <laughs> tell them why it's October. I, I like your okay. I okay, like okay. I'm going to tell know. them, John. Just, okay. Now, see, a lot of you, you know, you hear stuff <laughs> because on October 18th, 1587, was when the first Filipinos set first set foot in America, and so therefore. That is Filipino American history. That's a pretty, pretty intelligent explanation. But I did a lot of thought, John, and I came up with my little ism as far as why is October Filipino American History Month? Because that is the time of the year the leaves turn brown. Very nice. Go ahead. So with Very that good, said, Alan. thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll see you either tomorrow, no, second or third, 
but will continue to see you progress. So thank you. Alan B., the man people came to see. John Ragudas, we say, okay. what? Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Oh, how do you turn this off? <laughs> Ooh, stop recording.